Welcome back. As you know, I am Eli, the computer guy, and in today's class, we are going to learn how to use the OpenAI Vision AI to determine whether the endangered animal you dragged home will actually make a good pet. So if you've been following OpenAI, the creators of ChatGPT, for a while, you should know that they have an API service. So the normies out there, when they're talking about OpenAI or ChatGPT, they go to ChatGPT, which is an overall platform. So they go there, there's a nice little uh, prompt, you know, for them to be able to type things into. They type uh, something into the prompt, and then on the screen, the results show up. And with that, there are a lot of different services. They're simple chat functionality where you can ask it how to do simple tasks and programming. There's Dolly that allow you to do image recognition, uh, and there are a number of other things. But that's that's for the normies. What we as technology professionals care about are APIs because APIs allow us to build our own application in order to solve our very specific problems. And so the OpenAI API has been out for well over a year now and they have the chat completions. Basically using the API, you can make a request again to you know, figure out how to do something in programming or to learn history or that type of thing. There's Doll E that allows you uh, to have uh, ChatGPT or OpenAI create images for you. You may have heard of Whisper. So Whisper is their service that uh, allows uh, OpenAI to actually essentially transcribe audio files. Well, one of the cool things that they have just come out with is their Vision API. And so with what their Vision API is, is basically you can feed an image to OpenAI make a query. And the important thing to understand about this is you can make any query you want. What should this image be tagged with? What should the caption of this image be? What is in this image? Blase, blase, blase. You can just ask whatever, and then it will provide you with a response. And then with that response, you can do uh, whatever it is that you would like. One of the nice parts about this is how freeform it is. So again, I've been playing with computer vision, done many computer computer vision classes up until this point in time. And most computer vision uh, is very good, but it's very specific. It does exactly what it does. And that's it. The cool part about this is you can basically just ask open-ended questions, again, whatever kind of question that you want, and it will be able to give you the results. And the one warning with this, so we are now currently in the, the preview for the OpenAI uh, Vision API, so it's not completely finished yet. The one big caveat that they warn you on that other computer vision systems do very well is it's not very accurate at providing you exact coordinates for where something is in a picture. So when I use OpenCV, we've used that a lot, you know, I create those bounding boxes. So it's like, where is the face in this image? And then we get a bounding box around whatever we're looking for. You're not gonna be able to do that bounding box thing with the OpenAI Vision API is just not that accurate yet. But if you feed it an image and you say, would this make a good pet? It will spit out, you know, a nice little response here telling you why you should probably not have an eye as a pet. And so basically what we're going to be doing today is I'm going to be showing you how to create two very simple uh, applications using Python Bottle and the OpenAI API uh, for you to start playing around with this Vision API to see what the results are for yourself. So before we dive into the coding and such, the technical things that are going to be going on, let me just do a demonstration so you fully understand what you're going to be building today. There are going to be two applications that we're going to be building. The first one, we're simply just going to feed an image URL. Uh, we're going to feed it a query. And then what's going to happen is it's going to show you the image and then it's going to respond with whatever the response is for your query. So this is going to be the first example. The second example then is just so you can see what's gone on in the history of your queries, we're going to create a system that's going to then save the image, the query, and the query response into a SQLite database. And then not only are you going to have the current image and the response, but then you will have all of the previous images and responses. And so what that'll do is that'll allow you to test, you know, different queries, different prompts, play around to see what the results are, and then be able to go back and see what you did in the past uh, to see, you know, 
if you're getting the results that you think you should, or it'll give you a better idea of how to tweak things. Uh, so with this, uh, basically, uh, all I'm going to do here is, again, for today, uh, we're not going to be uploading anything. So when you use the OpenAI uh, Vision API, you can either upload images, or you can simply use a URL uh, and then feed uh OpenAI, that URL. We're simply going to do that today to make life easier. And so um, I just put in a little search for weird animals. Let me click on this weird animal. Look at that. Look at that. That's a weird animal. Oh, yeah. Let's, uh, let's uh, right click, essentially. We're going to copy the image address. Uh, we're then going to uh, paste that, paste that into there. And I'm going to say, what does this like to eat? Right? And again, that's the cool thing. You can ask whatever the hell question you want. It's not specific to any one thing. We're then going to hit submit. And depending on how it goes today, you might see me do a lot of fast dancing. Now, when I first started playing with the Vision API, it was quick. It was so fast. And then when I was trying to do the examples for today, it was so slow, so slow. So do realize when you're using their API, sometimes it's fast, sometimes it's not so fast. So anyways, okay, so I fed it this image. What does it like to eat? The animal in the image is a tarsier, a small primate that lives in Southeast Asia. Tarsiers are carnivorous and primarily insectivorous, meaning their diets mostly consist of insects. They also eat spiders, small crustaceans, and occasionally small vertebrates like birds, snakes, and lizards. So there you go. If, uh, if you're going to get one of these endangered species as a pet, make sure to get some small crustaceans so they, uh, they know what to eat. Here's one of the cool things. Here's one of the cool things. Uh, let's do this. Uh, dogs. Uh, so let me do dogs, right? And here's one of the things that I was really impressed with, right? So, okay, we got all kinds of dogs here. Now imagine if we could tell you what dogs are actually in an image, right? So look at this. We have this image and we have all kinds of dogs here, like a Shih Tzu and a Chihuahua and a whole bunch of furry things, right? So the cool thing is I can do a uh, copy image address. So you copy the image address, not the image itself. Uh, then we go here and uh, we plug it in. So we plug the URL in there and say, and you can say what dogs are in this picture. And then you can hit submit. And the cool thing is, I was actually surprised about this. Hopefully. <laughs> Hopefully. It'll tell me what dogs are actually in the picture, which is really kind of impressive. Again, when you're thinking about, you know, if you have a lot of images and trying to figure out taxonomy and trying to figure out how to so sort and be able to search off of those images, the fact that can do it is uh, pretty good. Well... <laughs> <laughs> sort of. One, a small, fluffy, white and gray dog which resembles oh, a Shih Tzu. Okay, so it resembles a Shih Tzu. Two, a small, alert, black and tan dog which looks like a Shiba Inu. Okay, a large, muscular dog with a brindle and white coat which is characteristic of a boxer. A robust, big, fluffy and red and brown dog looking like a Chow Chow. Okay, so it did give me the names. A small, blah, blah, blah. Um, so a Chihuahua, a German Shepherd, a Labrador, so on and so forth. So it did, it did, it did actually give me all of the species names. One of the things you do have to be careful about with open AI is sometimes it can be verbose. You know, when you run into one of those old people and they haven't seen anyone for a while and you're like, hi, how are you doing? And then they, they won't stop talking. Yeah, I kind of feel like that's open AI every once in a while. So one of the things to be thinking about is, again, when you create prompts and much more complicated uh, applications, you, you might want to tell it to not be quite so verbose. So anyways, this is the first example here. Uh, now let me stop this first example. See, this is Bottle. This is one of the reasons I like using Bottle is literally I can just have this script. I can hit run. And then when I do, it's simply running now and uh, I can use it, right? So this is, this is that second uh, application. Uh, so let me go back here and uh, let me go back, let's go back to those weird animals uh, that we had before. And um, I can go here, I can, again, I can do the um, copy image address. Then we can go here and I can go here and I can say, should I hug this? <laughs> Should I hug this? And we're going to go through, and it's going to tell me whether or not I should hug this. 
That should be that should be a new game show. Should I hug it? Um, let's see here. Should I hug this? I'm sorry, I cannot assist with that request. Uh oh, that might be a safety concern. You don't want to sexually harass or whatever the hell this thing. Uh, let's see. Um, give me ten tags for this picture in CSV uh, format. So comma separated value format. So I can hit submit. Hopefully, hopefully that will not offend the poor little monkey thing. <laughs> but you never know. Okay, there we go. So uh, proboscis, monkey, wildlife, animal, portrait, primatology, conservation, endangered species, nalays, lavar, whatever the hell. Anyways, so there we go. We have 10 comma separated value tags uh, for this. Now the cool thing is, right, we can go back, right? So this actually is using SQLite as a backend. Again, right now I'm in love with SQLite. I think SQLite is just amazing. It's a very simple to use database engine. Uh, but basically now I can go back. Uh, so this shows me the image. We did the query before, give me 10 tags. Okay, so that's what we just did. Should I hug this? It shows me it wasn't able to respond. Uh, what is this? So this is an image I did before with a test. This is a photo of a red-lipped batfish. Uh, what is this? It's an image of a blobfish. Uh, create a 10-word caption for this picture. Children watch in awe as elephants gather by tranquil waters. That same image, create 10 tags for this picture. What types of dogs are in this picture? And so this is the second app that we're going to be creating. And the value of this app is it gives us that historical reference so we can go through, we can do trials and errors to figure out how to narrow down to get the response that we want out of OpenAI. And again, we can actually go back and look at those things. One of the big problems you run into with OpenAI is the results it gives, you know, it, it, it can be difficult to fully grasp why it's giving you the types of results that it's giving you. So by having this historical context, it's a lot easier to go back and go, oh, that's what's going on. Okay, I need to tweak my prompt by a little bit. So anyways, these are the two applications that we're going to be building today. Very, very, very simple. And I, and I think, you know, if you're interested in computer vision at all, messing around with OpenAI's compute, uh, vision API is really going to be something that's interesting for you. Now let's talk about OpenAI's API side for a second, right? So this is the API that we're going to be interacting with. And one of the important things with APIs is that you basically have to do whatever the API creator wants you to do, right? You know, if some people say, why, why do you interact with an API in such and such way? And it's like, because that's how they designed it. I did not get a vote in this. So anyways, uh, you, it, basically all you do is you Google search for OpenAI API. Uh, if you do not have an account, you create an account with the, with the OpenAI, not ChatGPT, OpenAI. It is a different thing. You create an account. Once you've done that, you basically can come in to a... Uh, the page like this, uh, there's a whole bunch of different things like capabilities, text generation, function calling, embeddings, fine tuning, image generation, and such. We're going to want vision. You're also need, we're going to want to go up and create your API key. So we go to the side. And up here, you can see API keys. You can see I have an API key that will be killed as soon as this class is over. Uh, but you will need to create a new uh, API key in order to do this project and use it. Um, and then they, you know, they have a usage settings and payment settings and that kind of stuff. Uh, then you're going to come here to documentation and under documentation there is vi the vision component and the vision component is what we care about. If you come here you can see there's a nice little quick start guide. Uh, they'll show you how to deal with a URL. So basically this is what we're going to be dealing with with our web app today. We're going to feed it a URL. We're going to feed it a prompt and then it's going to give us back the results. If you scroll down here it'll show you how you can actually upload images. So if you have an image on your system. You can upload it to, uh, to OpenAI. Uh, you can deal with multiple images. Uh, there's a whole bunch of different stuff here, but basically uh, what we're going to be dealing with today is this basically just simply using uh, the URL and being able to make a prompt. Um, pricing is a big deal. Um, so when you go here to pricing, wow, 
hey, remember when I used to complain about like ChatGPT or OpenAI's pricing seemed a bit wonkadoodle in the past, obfuscation, I call it obfuscation of pricing. This is actually getting even weirder. So we use pricing, we can go down and we take a look at the language models, right? There's a lot of different language models here. And uh, basically this is going to be using GPT-4 Turbo. And under GPT-4, we have the vision preview. And now, it's $10 per million tokens input and $30 per million tokens output. <laughs> what does that actually mean? Well, if you come up here, one of the things you'll notice, if you come up here, you can say show prices per thousand tokens. So when you're using normal uh, API calls, it's about a thousand tokens. A thousand tokens equals about 750 words. Um, and generally for a decent quality image, a thousand tokens uh, equals approximately one image. So if we go here, we can see per thousand tokens, it's about one cent input and about three cents output. Uh, from what I've been able to tell, the pricing of vision, it comes out to somewhere around a penny of request. So when you're using uh, like ChatGPT 3.5, right, it's a fifth of a penny for request. So 750 words is a fifth of a penny, which who the hell cares? That number doesn't matter. At this point, you're starting to get up. You're getting up to a penny per request. So again, a penny every time you, you, you make a request of the image uh, API, this is something that you do have to be somewhat careful with. Because again, for you and me just playing around, who the hell cares? I burned 25 cents. Oh no. But something that you do have to think about is if you're going to be building this into a system, a penny per request at scale. I can bankrupt your startup post haste, as they say. So do be careful with the price. Again, it's really interesting looking at these prices and how they're obfuscating the prices. Again, even simply things, oh, now we're going to do a million tokens versus 1,000 1, tokens. What is a token, right? All that's going on. It can be very, very confusing to figure out exactly how much this is going to cost you. But for the experiment today, it should be relatively inexpensive. So now we get to the code. And for anybody at home that's been following on with my classes, when I code, I am trying to get better at this stuff, make it look a little bit cleaner. Again, do remember, I come from the sysadmin world where duct tape actually is a tool. Just put a couple more zip ties on, it'll be fine, right? So to be clear, when I do coding, I do code like an MCSE. In, in NT 4.0, but I'm trying to get better. So we have some more functions and stuff in here, I'm trying to make this a little bit cleaner. Uh, but basically this is the code that we have today. We've collapsed the functions uh, and we are using bottle. Again, I really like bottle for these types of projects. And the reason is, is because you have the run functionality basically at the bottom of the code. And in order to run this, I can just simply hit the run button and it is running and it is active and I can play around with it. With other things like Django and Flask, you have to actually call it from external. There's other stuff going on. Basically with Bottle, Bottle is a micro web app framework. And here's the thing, if you're doing testing or micro e type stuff, it's really nice because it's incredibly easy to use and just get going. To be clear, in a production environment where you're dealing with users at scale, I probably wouldn't use Bottle, but I'm trying to keep this stuff as simple as possible for you folks. So we have from Bottle, import, route, post, run, and request. You do have to import all of the functions or it won't work from Bottle. And then from OpenAI, we're gonna import OpenAI. We have our API key right here that will be deleted before this video is even uploaded. And then we have the client uh, variable with a value of the OpenAI function, and we're going to feed it API key equals this API key. And so basically, we're going to be able to feed this client value into the OpenAI function that we're going to create uh, and basically keep this a little bit separated. So we have the OpenAI get function here, and then we have our index function down here. So basically, what the index function is, is we have a route. So route, so this, uh, I'm using this on my computer, so 127.0.0.1, or whatever the IP address of the server or computer is on. And this means basically, the uh, the root directory, the web root directory. So 127.0.0.1, it'll drop you into this particular web page. Um, you know, Eli, the computer guy.com, it'll drop you into this particular web page. Uh, so we have the decor decorator of at route. 
So again, this is a route for bottle and we have a decorator of app post. This allows us to post uh, for, uh, HTML form values to this particular page. Uh, basically what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna open this up and then we have image equals request.forms.get the image query request.forms.get query. So basically down here, we're going to create a form on the page, right? And so the form action, uh, so it's gonna go to the root method equals post. Um, we're going to have uh, the, the type is text, the name is image. The value is going to be whatever the last image value was. Then we're going to have the name equals query. The value is gonna be whatever the last query value was. And then we are going to have the submit button. Let me run this for a second. So again, I can just simply run this. It's now running. Then I can go back here to 127.0.0.1 to kind of show you what's going on, right? So image URL currently is none, query uh, is none, and that is what we have going on right here. So it says none because we haven't done anything up until now. I can then plug in uh, that monkey and I can say, I don't know, uh, uh, give me a caption for this image in 10 words and I can hit submit and hopefully this won't take too long. Okay, there we go. So we have our weird little monkey with a big ass nose, thoughtful proboscis monkey pondering life's mysteries amid lush greenery, right? So this is what the results are. Uh, let me stop this right now. So this is the form, right? So when we put in the image, so we put in the image URL and then we put in the query that we want and that is the form. Then we're going to post these values back to this page, right? And so that's where these values come from. Image embed equals nothing. So we're gonna create a variable for image embed. This is going to be the, the image that's going to be embedded on the screen. We are gonna set it to nothing. We're gonna create it and set it to nothing now. So that the first time that we load the web app, we don't run into any errors. So we have image embed, it's just blank the first time. So if query does not equal none, right? So basically the query that comes in, right? If it's something other than none, actually uh, use it. So image response equals open AI get, we're gonna feed the client value, which is that API key. We're gonna feed the image, the image URL, and we're going to feed the query. That is then going to go up. And then this is where we get to our open AI. API function. The client, so this is basically the API key, the image URL, and the query. Response equals client, chat, completions, create, model, GPT-4, vision preview, role is user, content. Again, I don't fully understand this as a copy and paste type thing. Anyways, content is type is text, text is then query. Type image URL, image URL is the URL and the image URL that we're feeding it. So we're feeding it the query for text and the image for the URL. We're gonna say how many tokens to use. So for this, a max of 300 tokens. And then down here, response equals response dot choices, zero message dot content. One of the weird things is if we go to the vision API thing here, is that when they give you the response, they just do response.choices zero. So this is gonna give you a lot of additional information that you don't want. And so basically, if all you want is basically the response, again, the tags, the, the caption, whatever else, you're gonna want response choices zero message content. And then we're going to return that response. So response is gonna equal this, and then we're going to return uh, the response. So we come down here. So um, image response equals basically the response that's coming back from that function. Then we're gonna do image embed. We're gonna do a div style, 200 pixel width, image style, 200 pixel width, height auto, SRC equals the image. So basically the, the, the URL that came in. So that's gonna be put there. And then we're gonna break, and then we're gonna do the image response. So when we look at this, this is simply the image from the URL that we fed, and then this is the response that we got back from that OpenAI API uh, function that we created. Uh, then we have the form here, and basically page, 
the overall page is going to equal the form, the form, break, and then we're going to do a div style display flex. Uh, then we're going to do image embed. So we're going to embed the image within that. We're going to close the div and then we're going to return the entire page. And so when the entire page comes back, that's when we get that. And then down here, we're going to run uh, host equals 0, .0, 0.0.0. So that means basically any IP address on the server will provide the response. Port, I have it at 80. So I'm using a MacBook Pro. So it's very easy uh, to simply use port 80 for this. If you're using Linux or something else and you don't really understand how this works, you will probably have to use port 8080 or it'll fail out. And then debug equals true. And that basically means when there's a failure, give me whatever the debug errors are. And I want that because this is a testing environment. So this is basically what the initial uh, web app uh, looks like. And again, like if you're just, if you're just looking at the actual open AI function itself, this is all the open AI function. You could just put a query here and you could just put a URL here and it could just simply print out the response on the screen. And you can do that all in about 15 lines of code. And you know, that that's why, you know, the buzzwords that have been currently saying for a while is AI is hard, APIs are not. Getting a computer to understand what is in an image is incredibly difficult. Copy and pasting this API and doing a couple of tweaks, not so much. So now that you learned how to create the first variation of this web app, now we're going to use the one with a database backend. So basically, again, whenever you're going to be storing data from your application, you're going to need something called a data store. And again, what that data store is, it could be a CSV text file, it could be a Postgres database. What I like to use is SQLite. Basically, SQLite is incredibly easy to implement, and then you get all the power of a relational database. And again, I'm just currently a fanboy of SQLite right now. Everybody else is like talking about Vision Pro and, and Bitcoins. And I'm like, have you heard of SQLite? I love SQLite. Oh, I'm too much of a geek. <laughs> I'm too much of a geek, even for geeks sometimes. But anyways, you got to have that data store on the back end uh, to be able to save this information and then also be able to recover it. Uh, so that's where we have this. Uh, okay, let me turn that off. Um, and so basically with this, uh, we have the same app that we had before with uh, an additional database back in. So we're going to have bottle as we had before. We're going to have open AI as we had before. We're also going to import SQLite 3. Do make sure to put that 3 at the end. SQLite is most likely installed on your computer. If not, it's incredibly easy to be installed on your computer. Uh, import OS. And so we're going to need the OS for the, the file path uh, to the database that we're going to deal with. The open AI settings, again, API key is this that will be deleted client equals open AI with that API key then we're going to come down here and I'm going to create a class or I created a class for database again I'm trying I'm trying to make this a little a little more professional <laughs> as professional as an MCSE can be when it codes. Uh, so with class, basically what I'm able to do is I'm able to add a lot of functions uh, under the class. And so uh, what I've decided to do is basically just create a database class since I keep using the database for all kinds of different um, projects. And then I can call the different functions uh, from within this. So we have a path. So basically this is how to get the current directory. So one of the things again with Python, uh, if you don't modify where things are gonna be read from or saved to, it will always Always try to go back to your root directory and so I don't want that I want the database to be in the same directory that the script is in and so basically what I'm doing here with this path is I'm making the path to the directory that the script is currently in uh, then we have this uh, create the database so this is a big one so uh, uh, for SQLite, it's incredibly easy to create databases and tables and the rest of it. And so one of the nice things that you can do is you can simply create this uh, SQL, uh, this um, the statement, SQL statement, to create a table if it doesn't exist in the database. So, so that's the cool thing about SQLite. You do not have to install it. You don't have to, for the most part, unless you do, <laughs> but you don't have to create the database um, manually. You don't have to create the tables manually. Basically, everything can be created essentially by calling it. By calling the database, you actually create the database. And then for this table, create table if not exists. So it's an image table, ID, a column, integer, primary key, image column, text, query, text, 
image response text. So the things that we really care about is the image URL, the query that we're going to submit, and the response that we're going to get back. Uh, Cursor.execute, create table, the SQL statement, then you've got to commit it, and then you've got to close. And so basically what happens is as Basically, as you're running the script for the first time, when I do run, it will automatically then call this a database, so the database class dot db create function. So this will auto create uh, the database and the table for me if it doesn't exist. And then we can go here uh, to, to our root directory, basically the index page. Again, route and post, these are the decorators. Um, and here, again, the same thing we had before. So form, get, image, and query, just like we did before. Uh, then we have the embed, more or less, uh, like we did before. Uh, let's see here. And then we do an insert, right? So database dot db insert. So the database class, the insert function. We want to do the image URL, the query we submitted, and the image response. So if we come up here to the database. So we're gonna come down to uh, insert. So basically we're gonna do function db insert, the image URL, the query, the image response, and then we're simply gonna do, and this is gonna simply print out on the console just so we can see what's happening for troubleshooting purposes. This is the file path. We're gonna do the connection to the file path, and then here's our SQL statement. Insert into the image table, image URL, query, and response values, question mark, question marks, question mark, execute the SQL statement with image, URL, query, and image response, commit and close. So basically what happens is when I make that request of OpenAI, so right here is where I make the request of OpenAI, I'm then going to create the image embed that's going to go on the page, and then I'm going to insert the information into the database. After that, I'm then going to select all of the records from the database. So we're going to create a record variable. The value for that is going to be database.dbselect. So again, the database class, dbselect function. We're then going to go up here to the dbselect function. We got the file path, all that kind of stuff. Then the SQL statement, select all from image order by ID descending. So basically the highest ID, so again, that primary key, the highest will be first going down. So you, you wanna make sure you uh, order it properly. Execute the statement, record equals cursor dot fetch all. So fetch all the records from the statement, commit and close, and then we're going to return the value. So basically all records that came back. And that's what we're gonna have here. Then we're gonna have the form, basically like we had before. And then we're going to have the previous image. So everything that shows up down here. So this, all of this down here, in order to create that, we have to do a for x loop. So image previous equals nothing. So we start with a blank variable value for x in record. So record is all the records that came back from that SQLite database. Image previous equals first image previous. So basically this is tacking on. So initially it'll start as nothing here, but then as we keep creating these div blocks, it'll keep adding. Right, so it'll be nothing plus a div block. Then it'll be a div block plus a div block. Then it'll be a div block, div block plus a div block. Then it'll be a div block, div. You get my point. Anyways, div style with 200, image style with 200, uh, SRC equals. And so, oh, we got a little bit of this. There we go. And that's what it's called word wrap when it wraps around the screen. Anyways, so the SRC is X1. So we have the database, right? So, so we have the database and we have the columns in the database. Index zero is the ID. Index one is the URL. Index two is the query. Index three is the response. So for each record, the image URL is gonna be the X for the record with one, which is the URL. And then strong, basically this is gonna be kind of like that, that title thing here. See how this is, this is strong, right? And so strong is gonna be X2, so that's gonna be the query that we previously submitted. And then we're gonna do a break and do X3, and that is going to be the response that came back. And so basically we're gonna create a div block. So it's gonna start with nothing plus a div block. 
Then it'll be a div block plus a div block. Then it'll be a div block, div block, blah, 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 blah. Anyways, all right? And then if we scroll down, again, we've got page, uh, we've got the form, uh, we have the image embed, then we have the previous image, then we're going to return the entire page, and that is going to get us something that looks like this. And again, for you, I try to keep all of this stuff pretty simple. Uh, so if you know CSS and HTML and you wanna play around with the div blocks, you can, de you can definitely make it so the text would be over here or something like that. You can go and futz it with the formatting. I just don't wanna get into that with these types of classes because then people get really confused between formatting and SQL statements and it, it all kind of goes to hell. So anyways, uh, that's basically how these two examples work uh, and how they're able to to use uh, OpenAI's Vision API to be able to give you some very interesting inf information about images that you submit. Um, I think this is pretty cool. So there you go. There's the class on how to build a pretty simple web application to use OpenAI's Vision API to start to be able to play around with this stuff. Again, I think this can be very interesting. And one of the reasons it's interesting is because it's so flexible. So many other computer vision uh, frameworks out there that exist, I mean, are very, very, very good, but <laughs> And they do exactly what they do. The cool part about this is you can simply make that query, make that request. Do you want tags? Do you want a caption? Do you want a full explanation of going, what's going on? Do you want every species that's in a particular picture? Again, there's no, you're not locked in to what this will provide you. Uh, doing the research and all that, the only caveat is, is apparently, like I say, the coordinates, if you want to do bounding boxes for whatever reason at this point in time, it's not good with specific specific coordinates, uh, so you might run into an issue with that. Uh, but otherwise, again, I think it's very interesting. When you look at it, again, pricing, to be clear, they are obfuscating the pricing to make it so if you don't understand what you're going to be charged once you start using this as scale. But from what I can gather, I'm paying about a penny per request. And so for many situations, especially in like a corporate or organizational uh, environment, as long as you know what you're asking for, that can be very cost, you know, cost effective. Uh, imagine if you're working at a company and again, imagine you have a data store of just thousands of images, right? So you're at a company, you've had, you've had PR marketing people at your company for 20 years. We've had digital cameras for 20 years now. And so ima imagine you just have this folder of pictures from your, your company, like from retreats and from marketing events and from parties and from everything else, right? And again, one of the big issues is, is you know there's value there. You can use that for advertising. You can use that for social media. I think about posting anniversary posts in social media or whatever else or how far we've come, right? There's a lot of value there. But holy hell, you open up that folder and you're looking at like 5,000 images. <laughs> yeah, that sucks. What's well, cool though, as again, you could run through. Make make sure you know what request you want to do, you're, you're, what you're asking for. But what's really cool is you can take the folder that's there. And again, we'll do this in a different class. And take the entire folder with all the images. And you can literally process every single image and be able to pull out uh, whatever it is, uh, whatever information that you're looking for. You know, for tags, for captions, whatever else, right? That can be very useful. Do make sure, though, that you have some kind of caching mechanism for the responses that come back. When we talk about caching mechanism, this is some kind of mechanism that you're going to use to save the information that comes back, right? Running 5,000 images through OpenAI's Vision API at a penny a piece once, that's very cost effective. Uh, you don't want to actually have the search process be that it runs through 5,000 images every time somebody searches. I'm looking for an image with a dog. 5,000 images. Here are your three images with a dog, and that cost you $50. You do not want that. You do not want that. You, you, want, you want to do something where basically you run all the images through and you're like, give me 20 tags for these images. Or give me, and that's what we're going to do in a different class. It's going to be like, give me a caption uh, for this picture. Give me 10 tags for this picture. And maybe give me something else. So each one of those will be a request. So each one of those will cost you a penny a piece. But then every, every three cents, you will have the image with an auto-generated caption with the tags that are searchable 
plus maybe something else that goes along with it. And then you store that into your database. And again, that, that makes a lot of sense. As long as you are storing, store the damn responses. <clears throat> but anywho, <laughs> anywho. I think this is cool. Uh, so anyways, uh, as always, I enjoy teaching this particular class. Uh, all of the code and everything will be on GitHub or any of the other places where I publish my code. Uh, all of this is basically available to you. I don't imagine there's anything here that's sophisticated enough I could do intellectual property on. Uh, but if there is, I am telling you right now, please go use this as you see fit and start playing around and see, see what AI can do for you. And with that, see y'all later.